everyone and welcome to the Frontiers of Parameterized Complexity seminar. Our guest today is Edouard Bonnet, who will speak on twin widths. Please, Edouard. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. So, yeah, I will indeed talk about twin widths, and it's a joint work with Colin Genier, Eun Jung Kim, Stéphane Tomatze, and Rémi Vatrigan. So the, the way I want to uh, introduce twin widths here is as a generalization of co-graphs. So co-graphs, they are nice. They, many problems are poly time solvable on co-graphs. And we already know some generalization of, of co-graphs, which uh, bring the tractability that they have to like more general classes. Like you can see bounded click widths, such an example, or perfect graphs. So co-graphs, they have many uh, equivalent characterizations. And the one that we'll try to, to generalize is the following. So you can always find twins in, uh, in a co-graph. So a way to, to say it is that, well, you can find two twins that are either true or false twins, identify them and iterate this principle. And with a co-graph, you will manage to iterate this principle until you get only a single vertex in your graph. So with that in mind, I mean, there is something that we can relax here is the, the notion of being exact twins. Maybe we don't, they, the two vertices don't need to, to have the exact same neighborhood. They could differ on just a few neighbors. So if we would stop the definition here, we would capture things that are maybe too general. So you see that this uh, example here um, contains every bipartite graph as an new subgraph. So maybe we don't want to capture this graph in our class because on those things we don't maybe expect to, to have good algorithms. So why is this uh, graph passing the test of you can identify now almost twins or near twins? Well, you can find pairs of vertices like empty set and one differing only on one vertex. So here they differ only on the, the neighbor one. It's a neighbor for one, but not for empty sets. And you can find pairs of vertices like this that you can identify and slowly reach this point where we see that we get, you, you can see my mouse, right? Yep. Yep, okay. So uh, you get with two, three, four and the rest of the graph here, the same thing, but at height minus one. So you can iterate this principle again, get a K14 and now you can contract those vertices and get an edge and contract it. So this seemingly com uh, complicated graph passes the test. So we just need to add one ingredient to, to get the notion of twin widths. And the ingredient is to keep track of, of the errors. So you see that in the, the contraction sequence that I suggested here, we're always making an error on one. We were always contracting two vertices that were differing on one. So if you would record in the edges the errors that you've made and impose that the red degree, so the number of uh, red edges incident to a single vertex does not exceed some given bound, well, then you basically define twin width. So let's be a bit more specific. So we'll work with uh, three graphs. So we have non-edges, edges, but also red edges that you can think of error edges. Because we are contracting a graph into a single vertex, along uh, the way a vertex is actually a subset of vertices. So you can think of a non-edge here as, well, two subsets with absolutely no edge in, in between them. A black edge would be two subsets with the full biclick between them and the red edge would mean that there is at least one edge, but also at least one non-edge between the two subsets. Okay, so we can contract two vertices, even if they are not uh, adjacent, and we'll update the, the tree graph in the following way. So only the edges incident to the contracted ver uh, vertex will, will change. So we'll introduce errors towards all the na uh, private neighbors of, of one vertex. So you see, if I contract two and V, U1, U2, U3, and V1, V2, V3, they are private neighbors to U and to V, so they will now have a red edge linking them. If you look at the intersection of the neighborhood, so vertices from X1 to X7, uh, we'll, the only way to still get a black edge 
is that, so we have one example between UV and X3, is that UV, uh, UX3 and VX3 were both uh, black edges before. So this keeps being a black edge and all other combinations, one red edge, one black edge, or two red edges uh, will lead to a red edge. So this is an elementary operation for our construction sequence. Now let's try to, to get a full example. So we start from this graph, let's say, and well, as we said, what will be important is overall the maximum red degree. So I can try to contract E and F, then I introduce those two edges, red edges, because uh, for instance, F was linked to A, but E was not linked to A. And I can iterate this principle like this. So you see the red degree is at two, but never exceeded two. So that will tell me that the twin root is at most two. And in general, I will define the twin roots of a graph as the minimum integer, such that I have a sequence of contraction uh, leading to a single vertex, and such that the, the overall maximum red degree never went uh, above this threshold, D. So I will talk about a uh, sequence of D contractions or for short, uh, just D sequences. So this would uh, tell us that the twin width of the example was at most two. And you can check on, on this simple example that at the first contraction already, there was no way not to introduce a vertex with red degree two. So the graph had actually twin widths exactly two. Any questions so far for, for the definition of twin widths? I'll check the chat. No, okay, so let's continue. So now let's try to, um, to see some simple, simple classes of graphs if they have bounded twin widths. So if uh, we capture uh, simple classes of graphs. Let's start with arguably the simplest, trees. So we'll show that trees have twin widths at most two. And for that, we only need two simple rules. The first one is that when I find, when I can find two leaves uh, that are twin, so twin leaves, um, I contract them into a single vertex. So it doesn't matter if they are linked to their parent, to their common parent with a black edge or a red edge, I'll do the same. So here I have one, I can do this contraction here. And now I don't have this situation anymore. So I will observe a second rule, which is to contract the deepest leaf with its parents. So I have this deepest leaf, for instance, here. I will contract it with this vertex and get this tree graph. So here I introduce this red edge. Again, no twin leaf, so I go with the second rule. And now I can go back to the first rule because I created two twin leaves. So I will contract those two things. And well, you can see that because we give precedence to the first rule, we'll never create a vertex with red degree three. So we'll end up will uh, single vertex and well this uh, idea you could generalize it uh, to bounded tree widths but uh, also to bounded rank widths even bounded boolean widths so okay we captured those those uh, widths let's try to to go uh, one step uh, higher so there is still a simple uh, class of graphs where all those widths are unbounded uh, those are grids. So we'll see that the twin widths is bounded on grids. It's at most four. So even the twin widths of this graph is actually at most four, where I introduced already some error edges. So what I can do is that I can contract the two vertices here of the topmost red edge and do the same a bit below here and so on up to this point where what I obtain is well, the same, the same graph with one column less. So I can iterate this principle until I reach just a red path and then contract the red path or, or in any fashion, but from let's say one end point to the other. So you see that in this process, there was a vertex of uh, red degree four, but not five. And this um, would also work in higher dimension for higher dimensional grids. So you get a linear dependency between the dimension and the twin widths bound that you get. Okay, so maybe grids where 
too simple because they were uh, symmetric and also they didn't have uh, uh, vertices with high degree. So what about planar graphs that can, can that can have like high degree vertices, even high degree vertices that are neighbors and so on. So let's see if we can get something as simple as we get for trees and grids. And unfortunately here we hit the first wall is that there won't be something as nice as this. So you could hope that uh, there is a universal bound D such that whenever you're given me a planar tree graph, so a planar graph with some edges being red, I can find a contraction which is both good for planarity and for the red degree, meaning that the, the red degree would not increase above this bound. And this is a counterexample to that statement. So here, all the contractions that you can do, they either uh, break the planarity of the graph or they would increase this, well, degree four, this red degree four of those vertices here to five, but this four was arbitrary, could have been any bond D. So we cannot really hope for something local like this. And it seems that we need uh, more powerful tools. So to tell you about those things, I will tell you the, the true story about the, how we started this project. And we were not necessarily trying to generalize score graphs. We just read a very nice paper by Sylvain Guillemot and Daniel Mars. And the paper was about permutation pattern. So you're given a permutation tau, a large permutation tau, a small permutation sigma. And you want to know if sigma appears uh, in tau as a sub-permutation. Uh, sub so I can erase rows and columns to the matrix of tau such that what is left here is actually exactly the permutation matrix of sigma. And the algorithmic question was whether this problem can be solved in FPT time with respect to the size of sigma. So something uh, arbitrary, potentially arbitrarily bad in sigma times something polynomial in tau. And it was widely open until uh, Gimo and Marx showed uh, that not only we can find such a FPT algorithm, but the dependency in tau is very good. It's linear RPC here. And I will now um, oversimplify their, their algorithm just to, to extract the intuition that we need for, for our purposes here. So at the core of their algorithm is this breakthrough result by Marcus and Tardosh which was known to uh, imply the Stanley Wolf conjecture. So the Stanley, so there are n factorial permutations on ele n elements. The Stanley Wolf conjecture uh, is the conjecture that if you fix a forbidden permutation, so if you look at no instances of this permutation pattern problem for a fixed sigma, then the number of permutations that you get drop from this n factorial to just single exponential constant to the n. And well, what they showed implying the conjecture was the following, Let, let's parse it together. So uh, for every integer t, there is a bound ct. So that now if you take any n by n zero matrix with too many entries one, too many is above this bound. Then you will find something complicated, like bidimensionally complicated. So you'll find a t grid minor. So what is a t grid minor? It's a t by t division of your, of your matrix, such that in each cell, you have at least one entry one. So you see here, it's a four grid minor. I can find a one in every cell. So how can you use such a thing for a program on permutations? Because you start with a permutation matrix. It has only n one entries. So this bound, you will not be above this bound. So, what, uh, well, it's not exactly what game and marks are doing, but let's imagine it like this. So either the matrix is sufficiently sparse and we can find two rows or two columns that are sufficiently close to each other and we can identify them. By that, by that I mean that we make the matrix smaller and smaller, but the, the entries one, they, they don't disappear. So they accumulate and they densify. So at some point, because the N is dropping, well, this condition of Marcus Tardosh could apply. You could at some point have something dense enough. And if any time uh, this condition holds, 
we can actually answer yes. So anytime we have more than that many entries where n is the current size of the matrix, well, by Marcus and Tardosh, we can find such a, a t, uh, well, size of sigma grid minor, where not only we can find sigma by extracting one entries where we want them in the permutation, but we can actually find all the, the patterns of size of sigma. Okay, and what about if a never applies? So if it's always the case that B, that we can find two things that are close to, uh, close enough together that we can contract them. Well, then it means something about tau, the permutation you started uh, from is actually simple. So they quantify this in terms of, of widths and they well, get a dynamic programming algorithm when the permutation tau has bounded width. So now you can imagine, and it's true that if you try to generalize, well, the widths that they have on permutations to general graphs, you will end up with two nodes. So if we go to graphs now, it, uh, I will check the, there are questions. Uh, doesn't seem so, okay. So if you go to graphs now, uh, there are graphs that we want to uh, capture that are simple for twin width, sorry, like clicks, they have twin width zero, you can contract them in any order. Um, but for the green miner, there are complicated objects. You could find you, in, in the adjacency matrix of a click, you find arbitrary large green miners. So we want something where entries one and entries zero, they would play a similar role. And we'll trick the definition like this. So it's maybe not the most obvious way to, to trick it. The most obvious would be to ask that there is at least one entry zero and at least one entry one in every cell, but this would fail. We will just do something a bit more complicated. We'll say that the zone is complicated, it's mixed. If it's not horizontal nor vertical, not a copy of the same uh, row vector or not the copy of this and not the copy of the same column vector. So you see that here it's a three mixed minor, every cell, well, it's not the copy of the same vector. So this is a, a mixed minor and you can say that the matrix is T mix three if it doesn't have a T mix minor. So if, if it doesn't have such a division like this. So with that, we can actually characterize uh, twin widths. So here I just represent in one, represented one direction, but it's the, the difficult one and the one that will be helpful and useful for us. So let's uh, try to understand together. So there, if there is an order of the vertex sets, such that when I order the adjacent, the, uh, when I draw the adjacency matrix according to this order, the matrix that I get is simple in the sense that it doesn't have those T mix minor, it's T mix three. Then the twin width of my graph is bounded. So it's a double exponential in T, but well, if T is a constant, this is a constant. So now that gives us a new way to argue that the twin width of a class is bounded. So we can find a way to order the vertex sets of graphs within our class and argue that, well, this order was made to, to make things simple. So if we find something complicated like a T mix minor in the adjacency matrix now, maybe it means something, maybe it contradicts the membership to C because maybe C was that the, the graph is quite structured and we will contradict this. This is a, We'll see this on a couple of examples. And there is one uh, not so important observation is that we can work on, on these joint sets of, of vertices. So you can, if you have a large mixed minor, it would also work with green minor. Then you can work off diagonal so that uh, you, uh, yeah, the, the vertex set that you see in row and in columns, they, they don't interfere, they are disjoint. Okay, so let's try a first example, unit interval graphs. So we'll, so for unit interval graphs, the order should be quite obvious what to try first, and it will work is the, they are ordered by their left hand points in the representation by unit intervals. So you can try to do this. So if you look now at the uh, adjacency matrix, 
you will find three zones, zone of zero, zone of one entries, and another zone of zeros. But the ones that are trapped between two non-decreasing curves like this, and now you can check that whenever you uh, draw a three by three division, there will be one zone which is not complicated. So not only it's, hor it's horizontal or vertical, but it's indeed, it's actually both. It's constant zone here. So nice try, you managed to make those eight zones complicated. None of them is uh, horizontal or vertical, but this one is constant. Okay, so the, the next example, you can see it as a generalization of unit integral graphs. Posets of uh, bounded width. So posets where the size of the uh, maximum entire chain is bounded. So by Dilworth theorem, we know that those posets, we can partition them into a bounding number of chains. And there is an effective, uh, there is an algorithm. So if you have, uh, if you are a poset of width t, then there is an algorithm to give you a decomposition with t to the log log t uh, chains, which is good enough for us. So the, anyway, there are a constant number of chains here. So the order that we'll try is to just put those uh, chains one after the other in any order actually. Okay, let's try this. So now let's assume that there is a 3k mix minor. So if there is a 3k mix minor by the pigeonhole principle, it means that there is a 3 mix minor between two chains, say ti and tj. So let's zoom in on this uh, 3 mix minor. And well, by definition, all those zones, those nine zones should be complicated. So the zone R2 intersected with C2 should be complicated. So there should be something happening between C2 and R2. There should be an arc. So here, yeah, I didn't really define two units for digraphs. We'll have to encode uh, with minus one and plus one, depending on if the arc goes in one direction. Let's say we chose this convention that now this is a minus one. You see by transitivity that C1, all C1 is smaller than all R3. So it means that this zone is actually constant. It's only minus one. And symmetrically, if the edge would go in the other direction, then this zone would be constant. So both sets of bounded widths, they have bounded twinness. One last example, we left the planar graphs. So not only will show that minor graphs uh, have bounded twin weights, but KT minor free graphs in general, they have bounded twin weights. Actually, we, we will just see the simple case where the graph is Hamiltonian and also you're being given a Hamiltonian task. So you say, thank you, and you order the vertices according to this uh, Hamiltonian task. So let's do that. Again, we can do our trick. Uh, to be off diagonal, so that's those things here are different from those things here. And now if you have a mixed minor, well, in particular, it's a green minor, so in particular, in all those cells, you find one entry one. And well, you can now contract this in the sense of edge contraction, in the sense of minors. So you can contract A1, you can contract A2, and so on, because this is a path. You do the same with B1, B2, B3. And you get uh, KTT as a minor, so you get a KT minor. Of course, well, you're not guaranteed to have a Hamiltonian path. And to emulate this, we have to, to have a special LexDFS. Uh, and yeah, that is complicated, but settles the, the case of KT minor free graphs, but gives a terrible bound for planar graphs. So it's an open problem to get a decent bound uh, for planar graphs. Uh, we'll check if there are questions. And here you see that many classes have only twin widths. This is not this. Okay, so you can, yeah. Um, I would not consider here the, the cover graph, but I would consider the poset as a, as a digraph. Yeah, maybe I answered the question in what was nice. Okay, so all those classes here, they uh, have bounded twin widths. What did I do? Um, and no, 
not only they have bonded twin weights, but we can find uh, this sequence, a constant sequence, in polynomial time. So you see the first items we, we saw them, more or less. But there are some, yeah, among the last items, there are some surprising things, like you take any graph and you subdivide uh, the edges at least log n times, or even uh, some expanders defined in some way. So it seems that we're capturing a lot. So maybe we're capturing too much and we cannot hope for efficient algorithms. So let's ask this question. So can, can we do something faster than general graphs for graphs of bonded twin weights where we have the sequence as we can have for those graphs here? Um, and we'll start with k independent set, which is the complement of the problem which was need to enter the zoom call. So you want to find k vertices that are pairwise non-adjacent. So you're, you're uh, given the sequence. In the form, you start from the graph G. Um, and from G to Gn minus one, this is the first contraction and so on up to G1, which is a single vertex. So those are three graphs. And the, uh, the idea of the algorithm fits in just one sentence, this one. So we'll, by doing programming, we'll store one uh, best partial solution for each red connected subgraph of bonded size. So what is a red connected subgraph? Those three graphs, they have red edges. So you can look at the red graph, the, the graph induced by those red edges. And red connected subgraph will just be a connected subgraph in this graph. We'll consider only um, such connected subgraphs that are that are of size at most k. So let's uh, have a sanity check that this can lead to an FPT algorithm. So, uh, well, the one good thing about the red graph it it has degree d at most d by definition of twin weights. So the number of red connected subgraphs, if I fix uh, a tree graph, well then I have n for uh, my initial vertex, I start somewhere, and then I describe a connected subgraph in a graph of degree d. So this you can describe with walks of, of lines 2k, so I have at most d to the 2k times n such things. And I would need to multiply by n for the n tree graphs, but we'll see that actually we don't need this square. So we'll get uh, an algorithm which is single exponential in k times n. So we start with uh, G, which is a graph without red edges. So the, the red connected subgraph, they are trivial. They are just singletons. And on those single vertices, the best partial solution is, well, for independent set, is just to take the vertex in the, solu in the partial solution. So we'll initialize uh, the dynamic programming like this. And at the other end of the sequence, we have uh, a graph on a single vertex, G1. So if, um, I mean, you can see it as the whole graph G was contracted into this vertex. So if now in this vertex, we find a partial solution of size at least K and what we did so far made sense, then, well, this should correspond in, to a global solution in the original graph. So we can then answer yes. So what is missing, of course, is how to compute from the partial solutions of GI plus one, the partial solutions of the next three graph GI. So we'll see that now. So let's say you, to go from GI plus one to GI, you just contracted UV and rename it Z. Now you're asking, what is the best solution corresponding to the gray pattern here? You see that the gray pattern is indeed a connected subgraph in the red graph. So I could ask this question. So, and by inhabiting the gray zone, I mean that, well, those things are subsets in G. And this means that I will take at least one vertex uh, in what, what is contained in this vertex in G in my, so in my partial solution. So to do that, I have three possibilities. Either I take something in U or something in V or something in both. And for each of those three choices, this pattern here 
splits in GI plus one into a bounding number of, of components in the red graph of GI plus one. So I represented in blue the one of V and you have uh, one, two, three, four, five additional connected components to find to form this one. So those things we already stored uh, some uh, value for the solution. We'll just sum them. Well, first check that there is no uh, black edge in between, so they can correspond to a solution. Then sum the value of the solution and take what's best among those three units. So here, the choice I've made of inhabiting V but not U is actually the, the only thing that can lead to a solution because you see that there is a black edge between U and this vertex. So if you inhabit U, you cannot realize this pattern. And yeah, that's basically it. Why we don't need this N square, as I said on the previous slide, it's because we actually need just to update uh, partial solutions that are, that are containing Z, so that are close to, to the contraction. So this thing, uh, well, works directly for K-click because if you complement the graph, your D-sequence is also working as a D-sequence. But for other programs like K-dominating sets, that would uh, entail a worse dependency in, in D and well, also subgraph isomorphism or the induced version of this program. And in that case, the dependency in K would be a bit worse. But in any of those cases, the complexity remains uh, reasonable. Um, so let's see, maybe there is something more general. And okay, is there a more general FPG algorithm? And the answer is yes. And for that, I will talk to you a bit about first order model checking. So I, I will define it by example. But yeah, you're, you're given a graph and you're given a formula without three variables. It's called a sentence. And this, form, this sentence can talk about the edges of the graph, can put equalities, and all the usual uh, syntax for first order logic. And yeah, have to, to say if your graph satisfies the, the sentence. So some quick examples. So what is this? So we have, there are k vertices such that for every vertex, either we are one of those k vertices or we are adjacent to one of those. So this is the k dominating set. And if I write something like this, uh, there are k vertices, this time they need to be distinct and there should be an edge in between, there should be a non-edge in between them. So this is k independent set. Okay, and we can do other things. And I will take two slides to define a bit more so that uh, when I talk about FPT algorithm for FMO checking, we can put it a bit into uh, well, a different view of model theory. So let me define transductions. So for that, I need to define interpretations. So there are just a uh, way to redefine the edges. So you say, okay, now the edges, they, are, they follow the formula phi. And if I write like something like this, the negation of the edge uh, predicate, then this would complement the real graph. Here I can also keep an edge, uh, an existing edge and add one if there is a vertex which is linked to both, so that would square the graph. So this is an interpretation and there is a more robust uh, thing that will give a simplified definition of it. So it's a method transduction. So basically it's the same thing, but I start with some non-deterministic coloring by a constant number of colors. So I have uh, constantly many union relations that appear magically, then I interpret, and then I can take an induced subgraph and I can remove, uh, remove the, the colors. I don't care about the union relations anymore. So let's see uh, what it means exactly. So I can, for instance, well, receive this, uh, coloring by those unary relations. And now you see that I can uh, say whether a vertex is blue or red or green. So now the formula can, can use yeah, those unary G, B, R and uh, re redefine the edges like this. 
So for instance, here you would keep the original edges and you would add something between a green vertex and a blue vertex if this holds. So if I did it correctly, then this would add those edges here. And then you can uh, yeah, remove the cars, take some into subgraph. And you see that with the interpretation, you are going from one graph to one graph. Here you go from one graph to many graphs. And you can define the same for classes. You take all the graphs of the class and you apply transactions on them. So you can define what is the transition of the class. So what we showed is that uh, bounded twin width uh, is preserved by transduction. So if you take a class of bounded twin widths, you apply any transduction, it still has bounded twin widths, and this is effective. Okay, and I want to yeah have this slide of this small slide of model theory. So uh, I just want to introduce two notions: monadically stable and monadically nip. But I will just uh, shorten to just stable and nip. So now we know what a transduction is. It will be easy to understand those things. So a stable class is a class where you cannot, by transduction, get uh, all linear orders or all ladders. So you see that this graph is uh, particularly suited to define linear orders. And NIP class is that you cannot get, by transduction, all the graphs. OK. So I will. Maybe check if there are questions. Okay. Um, so to give you uh, some examples, so bounded degree graphs, they are uh, stable. You cannot define an arbitrary ladder or linear order. Unit interval graphs, they are not because actually this ladder, yeah, I should say that this I want semi-induced, so I don't care if there are edges or not between those things here. What I want to see induced is only what is going from this part to that part. So you need interval graphs. If I put two clicks here and there, this is actually realizable with unit intervals. So they are not stable, even their edge relation is not stable, but they are NIP. You cannot get all the graphs uh, with the transaction of unit interval graphs. While interval graphs, they are not NIP. So there, are, there is a transduction that would get all the graphs. So not NIP is a triple negation because NIP is not the independence property. So this is not, not, not dependent. So it's definitely not dependent. And bounded twin widths classes, they follow uh, the unit interval graphs. So they are NIP, but not stable in general. You see that twin widths split interval graphs into, well, unit interval graphs have bounded twin widths, but not interval graphs in general. Okay, so are there questions about those things? Are you still there? Maybe I'm talking, hold on. Yeah, still there. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, so what about uh, for model checking on classes of graphs? So this has been uh, looked at a lot. And um, yeah, because now we know about the stable and NIP class, I can see uh, differently sparseness and denseness. So you see that I put map graphs with the sparse classes, which is strange because map graphs, they can have arbitrary large clicks. But I place it here because you can interpret them from sparse uh, classes and are stable. Uh, okay, it doesn't really matter. So uh, it started with bounded degree that there is an FPT algorithm for the whole f model checking. So this was seized in 96. And then there was a program lasting 20 years or so, uh, climbing this ladder from planar graphs to nowhere dense graphs. So it, yeah, it doesn't really matter the definition of expansion and nowhere dense, you can, it won't be, uh, it's just if you know it, great. And otherwise, you can take this as a black box. So people were increasingly getting more and more general things around this line here. This is a has diagram. So when, when you go up, you go more general. And this ended in 2014 and was the end of the story for subgraph closed classes. This is where you take subgraphs. Uh, you're still in the class. Because for uh, those classes, 
having a tractable FOMO checking is exactly the same as being neural dense and also exactly the same as being stable, not interpreting uh, linear orders. But it's definitely not the end of the story for other classes that are dense, they contain clicks, so they cannot be subgraph closed, otherwise they, con they would contain everything. So, well, it's very active to, uh, in one hand, uh, get those results work for structurally those classes, meaning uh, when you uh, use transduction, so you, you start from an over dense class, for instance, and you use a transduction, but also uh, dense classes that you see here. So this is a bit of an outlier and this happened before. So for a more general than, it's more general than FO on MSO1, uh, for classes of the rank widths, you can solve uh, the model checking efficiently. You can see the, the algorithm of Guillaume Moir Marx as solving subgraph isomorphism, which is a sizable fragment of uh, formal checking. And on posets of bonded widths, this result of 2015 by Gajorowski et al. So FOMO checking is also FPT and 2017 for mark graphs. So where does uh, twin widths fit? It fits here. So it's uh, generalizing what we know on, uh, in the dense world and a bit of what we know in the sparse world up to proper minor closed classes. Um, well, this dash dotted edge means that this inclusion could hold. So it could be that polynomial expansion actually conjecture something stronger than the fact that polynomial expansion uh, is included in bounded twin nits. And everything where there is no edge or dash dotted edge means that it's incomparable with twin nits. So in particular, bounded degree and bounded twin nits uh, are incomparable. So yeah, I should state our results. So we showed that FML checking uh, on classes of only twin nits, but given with a D sequence, where the input is given with a D sequence, we can find such an algorithm where the dependency is uh, huge in the size of the formula and the twin widths, but then it's linear in the size of the graph. So this is a bit of a recap and of what we saw. So we start with our graph. We want the contraction sequence that will be needed for a formal checking algorithm. So either we, we get it with a direct contraction sequence as we saw for trees or grids or we go uh, through this, uh, this order, as we saw for uh, posets of bounded widths or KT, KT minor free graphs. Okay, now for, for those classes, we'd have the graph, but also the contraction sequence. And so what's the workflow of the, the algorithm? So from there, we'll actually not care about the formula at this point and compute a very large uh, tree, very large in, in some parameter L, uh, which contains every question to for, uh, sentences of depth L, of quantifier depth L. So you see that this, this takes uh, linear time if you hide the fact that there is a dependency in L and the twin D, which is huge. So it's a tower of exponentials of this, uh, of height roughly L and D. But this is needed even for uh, model checking of trees, you need this, uh, this tower of exponentials. So you get this large tree, well, which is large or constant, depending on what you, how you see L. And then you can query in constant time if you see L as a constant. Uh, such questions, does G satisfy my sentence of uh, quantifier that's L? So, yeah, I can hand wave a bit about the FML checking algorithm. Basically, it's like the independent set algorithm, except it's more complicated. So because the partial solutions are more complicated, we're not just uh, storing independent set, we're storing uh, those things, those trees here that we call morphism trees. But yeah, um, from very far, it looks like the same. So we will update the morphism tree after uh, a contraction of things that are local to this contraction 
based on the morphism trees of the uh, previous steps. So yeah, I won't say too much about this actually. And I will uh, go on to things that are unrelated, but equally interesting, hopefully. I will also check if there are questions. No questions. So, um, yeah, probably one, the, the most intriguing conjecture that we have concerns small classes. So, um, what is a small class? It's a class that when you label elements, so think class of graphs, when you label your vertices from one to n, then the number of elements in your class is actually not that big. It's just single exponential once you have the labeling. So we showed that uh, classes of bounded twin widths are small. And this generalizes two results. Uh, the result that we saw, the Stanley Wolf conjecture proven by Marcus and Tardosh. So you can see that as the smallness of uh, permutations avoiding a fixed pattern. And there was a similar result for KT minor free graphs by Norin et al. two years later. And yeah, because we saw that those are two examples of classes of bounded twin widths, we yeah, give a uh, unified uh, explanation of, of this smallness here. And it's also the first time that I can tell you that something is not of bounded twin widths. So there are classes that are not of bounded twin widths be only because they contain too many graphs. So subcubic graphs, integral graphs, for instance, those are not small classes. Their growth is, is larger than, than this n factorial, n factorial times c to the n. So we know we have this uh, strange situation where, for instance, if I focus on subcubic graphs, we know that collectively they have unbounded twin widths. So there is a sequence of cubic graphs or subcubic graphs with larger and larger twin widths. But yet we cannot explicitly uh, show you like this sequence of graphs and tell you that the twin widths of those graphs will go to infinity. So this is peculiar. And um, let's move on to this, uh, what we call the small conjecture. So if you would ask for the converse of this statement, uh, it's really uh, false because you can build uh, a class where you put only one graph per, per uh, size n. So you will have only n factorial uh, up to labeling. And you put the graphs with larger and larger twin widths. So you get something of unbounded twin widths, which is small. But now if you add the condition that the class is hereditary, so it's uh, closed by induced subgraphs, then this question makes sense. And we boldly conjecture that for hereditary classes, this is the same to have bounded twin widths and to be small. Um, I will say in the last slide a bit more about this. Bold, bold, yep. it's not very bold. It's very bold, yeah. Uh, and we have 10 minutes, so yeah, so I have time for everything. Um, so you can, there is a very successful theory of sparsity. So those things that are, I didn't define to you with bounded expansion and lower denseness. Uh, you could try to see what's the intersection between bounded twin widths and those things. But then there are many ways of, of uh, like projecting twin widths on sparse classes. It turns out that most of those ways are equivalent, which is quite nice. So if you define twin widths with the degree uh, minors instead of d mix minors, or if you look at bounded twin widths, but also on graphs excluding, on classes excluded KTT as uh, the by click as a subgraph, or if you ask that the number of edges is at, as, is at most linear, or if you want that the expansion is bounded, all those things are actually equivalent. So there is somehow a robust uh, notion of of sparse twin widths. Uh, still, those thing, those classes with bounded sparse twin widths, let's say, are fairly complicated. So they still contain expanders. 
they contain things that we don't know very uh, yeah we don't know very well like uh, classes with one with stack or two numbers and so on so yeah it's a robust notion and but still captures interesting and yeah, complicated classes i think it's the last thing i want to to tell you before i, I conclude it's about chi boundedness so a class is chi bounded if you can bound the, the chromatic number by a function of the click number. And we showed that all uh, our bounded units also behaves well with this uh, consideration. So it has uh, every bounded units class is chi bounded. And the bound is like this. So you can color them with uh, d plus two, where d is the bound on the twin width to the uh, click number minus one. Uh, well, the dependency in omega is exponential. So you could ask whether uh, bounded twin roots classes are polynomial chi bounded. So have the same bound, but now polynomial in omega. And this we don't know, it's an open question. But um, we know a weaker statement. We know that bounded twin roots classes uh, at least satisfy the stronger notion on property. So I will, uh, when you deal with sky boundedness, usually it's really uh, about bounding the chromatic number in the triangle through case, and then it's uh, by induction you get a general thing, at least for two minutes it was like this. So I will uh, tell you why classes with bounded twin units that are triangle free have small chromatic number because it's very simple and quite nice. And what is nice is that we use the sequence, but in the other way that we used it uh, for the algorithms that we saw. So we'll d plus two color such graphs by starting from the end. So we start with a single vertex. So we have only one vertex, so we give it color one. And then what we want to do is to rewind the sequence. So the sequence of contraction, if you go it uh, backwards, you see splits. So you see a vertex and then you see two vertices and so on. So our task is just to find new colors for the, the vertices that, that, that are popping when, when they split. Okay, so there are two cases. So here you go, you, you, you see you go from uh, GI where this vertex is Z and Z splits into U and V. So this is the first case where Z would be incident only to red edges. Again, by definition of the twin widths, we know that it means that it doesn't have too many neighbors. It has at most D neighbors and at most, well, at most D colors in the neighborhood. So two vertices are, are uh, I mean, Z gives rise to U and V. So U will keep the color of of Z and for V, well, here we have only D, at most D plus one ver uh, color. So we can find uh, D plus second color for V. So in that case, we're not in any trouble. So you see that the, the union of the neighborhood of v, U and V is actually the neighborhood of Z. So there won't be any conflict here. The, there are no vertices appearing in, in the neighborhood of those two vertices that were not part of the picture here. Now the other case is that there is at least one black edge incident to Z. Okay, so let's say we have this black edge here. And a black edge, remember, it's a bi-click between those two subsets, uh, those two vertices. So now if Z splits, there cannot be an edge in between those two things. A black edge, of course, but also not a red edge because uh, this is black, this is black a red edge would mean at least one uh, edge in between those two subsets, and you would find a triangle like this. So when it splits, you know that there is a non-edge between them. So you can actually keep for both U and V the color of Z and proceed. So, so that you never need more than D plus two colors. So I, I will end with uh, obvious open uh, questions. So yeah, the one thing is that Okay, we, we should how to compute twin widths uh, in many classes, but we cannot do it in general graphs. 
So if we if we are given in general graphs with let's say one constant twin width, we cannot uh, even approximate twin width to get an, another constant larger and sequences uh, with that constant. So we don't expect twin widths to be uh, exactly computable, but we just want an approximation when the twin width is is, uh, is a constant basically. This is an open question. Uh, there is this uh, tantalizing question of fully classifying classes that are track where FML checking is tractable. So and now if you remember the, this picture, there are in the sparse case and the dense case, there are two things explaining, uh, well, mainly two things explaining the whole picture, uh, nowhere denseness and uh, now bounded twin widths. So you can think of going uh, higher, so trying to generalize those two things, but there are other approaches and maybe it's, it's, this is not the, the right way how to, to proceed. We talked about the small conjecture. One first step would be to show that uh, classes with polynomial expansion, they, they have only twin widths because this is a small class. So if you believe the conjecture, you should be able to show that, that but we currently cannot. And yeah, there are many other questions, whether you can get better approximation in uh, classes of bounded twin widths and so on and so forth. So if you, I will stop here and if you were interested, we've put the first three papers uh, on archive. So here I covered uh, a bit of all three, but yeah, mostly the, the first one. And I will thank you all, uh, I uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. So, any questions? I'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Yes, please. <clears throat> hey, Edward. Thanks for the nice talk. So, for this um, basically has diagram that you have on the right of the slide at some point, generalizing from planar graph to bounded genus to H minor three. Yeah. Diagram has been mined extensively with respect to kernelization. And in particular, for dominating set, uh, the kernels reach quite high up the hierarchy. I'm yeah. wondering if you thought about kernelization questions for the dense side of this hierarchy at all. So we thought about it for specifically for twin widths, mm -hmm. and we uh, for dominating set it actually yeah it makes sense. I I think you there is room for that for a polykernel. But it cannot be too general. So, for instance, for independent set, you you cannot hope for polykernels because you can uh, uh, you can take like uh, yeah twin widths is closed by complement. So, disjoint union of or, or complete sums of things with bounded twin widths will have bounded twin widths. So it's easy to or compose or uncompose. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for dominating set, it it uh, it's a nice question and yeah uh, it. To our knowledge, it's uh, it's possible, but there is a polykernel, but specifically the main thing set. Okay. And more generally for dense classes, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, but we yeah, that's a good question. So, so what is known about approximation algorithms? Um, so we have some observations actually in the third paper in the conclusion of the third paper. So there is something funny going on is that uh, if you get a constant approximation for maximum independent set, then it, you can improve it uh, to a PTAS um, using the lexicographic product because it, it preserves also bounded twin widths. So you can use this, uh, this uh, old trick of, of boosting the, the approximation uh, ratio uh, and yeah keep being in, in classes of bounded twin widths. Uh, yeah, and we have some things that are not uh, yet uh, written up about dominating sets that we can approximate better than in general graphs. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I, uh, I also have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, sorry if you talked about this and I uh, didn't hear it, but um, is the relation between twin width and click width obvious? Um, no, no it, not? Yeah, it, it's not obvious. So bounded, uh, bounded twin width is more general than bounded click width. Okay. Uh, it's not obvious, but it's, uh, yeah, it's following this, uh, it's a bit more complicated, but it's following this thing that we saw for trees. So for instance, three bits, you would go to a leaf bag, a deepest leaf bag and perform a contraction there and try to, to, to make that the, the right connected component there are of small size. So in particular, the degree. And yeah, it works the same with Boolean widths. So also with rank width. So yeah, those things are, are uh, contained in bounded uh, twin width classes. I see, thanks. Okay, and uh, the other question is, uh, do you have uh, a natural uh, problem, which is say uh, W1 hat uh, in bounded uh, twin width classes? And by natural means something like, for example, an MSO model checking yeah. instance characterized by the size of a formula or something like that? Yeah, so we cannot uh, hope to solve MSO because of planar graphs. So if you express, for instance, three coloring, uh, with an MSO formula. Ah, uh, okay. They have one between it, so you can. I, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I would have maybe uh, another question. Yeah. So you said that there are algorithms to. Um, so once you have found a uh, twin width, you have algorithms to solve various problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my first question would be, probably you already said it. I mean, you gave this always a sequence of contractions, but uh, if I give you a graph, uh, can you compute the uh, twin width? So this is the, the main open question. So in germ, we have to use uh, the membership to a particular class. So if you give me a, a general graph, we, we, we don't know currently how to, to compute or to approximate uh, Okay. Contraction sequence. This is the yeah the main open problem here. And my second uh, question would be okay. So now let's say I give you uh, this contraction sequence. Yeah. And I ask you, hey, can you uh, uh, you say now you have this algorithm for let's say k click. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, I mean, it was FPT, but I think it was d to the k squared or something. No, d to the for click it would be d to the k. D to the, D to the K, um, but I don't know, like, uh, let's say I give you an actual graph. Uh, do you think you have any chance that you could uh, compete with your twin width in the pace challenge? That's a good question. Uh, well, the, yeah, that would be quite artificial, but if you, yeah, if you have a, a good sequence, it's not, I mean, those algorithms are not uh, that horrible, and you, there are maybe some optimization that you could do in, in practice. But yeah, the the thing is that finding the sequence and getting a good sequence is is, is difficult. So in a realistic setting where I'm not starting, we're not starting with a huge advantage of having a good sequence given to us, then probably the answer is no. Uh, but uh, what would be what do you mean with good sequence like where where where, the, where d is is small is small enough so is as small as possible so what do you think where would you stop being able to uh, uh, use an algorithm using twin width let's say if twin width is about 10 you stop or twin width about well, it's also well, it's also depending on k but yeah if, if both would be below 20 then it's reasonable to to do something uh yeah the, the okay. constants are not so bad so you can you can do that but if, yeah if it goes above 50 or 100 then probably not probably just yeah and so you say these are worst case bounds right yeah but if if my uh if my sequence really realizes a d of uh, 20 and my k is really uh, let's say 50 mm -hmm. then that's also how long you would take, or could you be lucky and be fine? Yeah, you can be lucky. Actually, it's it's hard to to evaluate the 
the actual complexity. So the actual complexity depends mainly on the number of red subgraphs. And this you can be, uh, yeah, you, you can have things where actually the the twin widths is, the D of the twin widths is quite large, but still you get uh, not so many red subgraphs and that would be the actual important thing. So yeah, it's a, it's a good, good point. So, so the, the quality of the, the sequence is, is a multi criteria basically. Okay, I think we wrap it up uh, at this moment. Thank you very much again for the, for the nice talk. Yes. Thank you. And see you all in two weeks. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay, bye, it was nice to uh, yeah. see you again. And uh, yeah, maybe we can have a coffee at, at some point. Uh, sure.